Hello everyone, I'm Mark Snodgrass, and today I wanted to talk to you about seven highly effective beast modes you can use in Domo, help uh, your dashboards uh, become that much more useful. And I use these quite often, so I wanted to be able to share them with you and hopefully you'll find them useful as well. So let's get started. So the first one I wanted to share is uh, I'm using this in this dynamic text box card to prompt the user to select uh, a state, something from the filters here. So how I do that, if we go into this beast mode. You can see I'm using a dynamic text box card and I've got a beast mode here called state select in the category. And then I'm just putting a count in here and that in the value doesn't really matter there. But if we look at this uh, state select, we can click on this. What I'm doing is checking for how many uh, states are visible to Domo at that point to that card right now. And when it's unfiltered, the count of that would be 40 or 50 or however many are in my state filter list. And so when I see that count of being greater than one, then I render the text, please select a state. Otherwise, I'm gonna do a concact and I'm gonna do, say overview of that state selected. So it's just a case statement. Case statements are really useful. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, I encourage you to research them and uh, understand how they work because they uh, you can use them quite often. So I'm saying case when this count distinct, so number of states in that data set, when that's greater than one, then please select a state, otherwise overview of state. So you see right now in this card, I'm not filtered to anything. So it's gonna say, please select state. And when I use a filter in here, then it now switches to say overview of Oregon. So that's how that uh, beast mode works. Really helpful to prompt the user to say, oh, yeah, I need to select something because all these cards are really not filtered on anything and that's maybe the intention of the dashboard is to you filter on something and every all the cards on the dashboard then are filtered to that. Second one is dealing with um, incomplete months. So maybe you don't want to um, show a month that's only partially full. So you know, this is can be a little bit misleading that September is under and well we're in middle of September, so that's that's why, and maybe we don't want to show that, and we can make a beast mode and then drag it into our filters and toggle that and say, no, we don't want to show uh, the current month. And so we uncheck yes there and let the user decide on, on wanting to do that or not. So in order to do that, it's this beast mode here. And using a, a great date function, in here that's available and if you look through the lists in here last day last day is a great way to just compare am i in the same month uh, and year as the current the current date rather than doing a separate function for month and a separate function for year and evaluating both of those what you can do is use the last day which will just take the date from your data set and move it to the last day of the month and then you can use the current date and apply last day to that, and I'll move it to the last day of the month and then evaluate that you're looking at September 30th, 2024 on, on both things. Uh, and then we know, oh, yep, that's part of whether this is September 3rd or 5th or 6th, and this last day function is going to move it to September 30th. And so then it will evaluate, yep, we're in the same month and year uh, as uh, current month. So we don't that is the current month. And so we're going to put a yes on that. Otherwise, we're going to put a no. And we just drag that into the filters and toggle that as a quick filter. And so then we can let the user decide, yeah, we want to show that. Or no, we don't want to show the that incomplete month. Really handy for that for doing financials or something like that, where you're not wanting to maybe present all of the information you have because the month is not complete. Third one is uh, dealing with kind of showing an overall average uh, versus uh, individual average. Again, we filter to Oregon here. You'll see this group average. 
showing and letting you see here. Here's what Oregon's earthquake totals have been and what the group average totals have been. And we can do that using fixed functions. And that's um, a bit trickier to use for sure. Um, if you haven't seen the knowledge base article around fixed functions, I would encourage you to read that. I'll try and add it into the comments afterwards. But there's a lot of things you can do with the fixed functions and being able to show um, aggregated totals on here. And what I'm going to do is uh, use this to get that group average, like I said. And we can make this a little, maybe slightly easier. So I am doing a sum sum one. So fixed functions require kind of two aggregates to be used. And the sum sum one gives me basically the um, overall total. And I'm fixing it by the date in here and by the um, state name to get that. And then I'm dividing that by the number of states in that month. And, um, you know, and then I'm fixing that by, and I had to do this last day date here. I was finding that when I just had a date, it was not giving me the correct number of states. It was uh, giving me maybe the highest one of on a given day during that month. So I applied the last day. So those all got grouped together. Uh, and so then I could get the number of states that were active, had earthquakes during that month. Oddly enough, I didn't need to do that here. Um, I was getting the right number with that. So some things take a little trial and error and breaking things down. Um, but then I'm doing this uh, filter deny state name so that I'm not um, filtering down to win someone selects a particular state. So is it going to ignore when someone uses that slicer at the top of the dashboard to be able to give me that overall total? So I'm dividing those two numbers to get the uh, average, the monthly average here. But again, a little tricky, uh, a little funny syntax on things with the double aggregate, the parentheses, where the fixed and the by, and then you're fil on this case, I'm filtering. Uh, to deny that state name filter, but then that gets me uh, what I want of that overall average. And you can see, if we hop out of here. I hover over the group average. I'm going to get that 378, 368 number, and it doesn't matter if I pick Alaska or not. You're going to see Alaska being on the high side of the average, but um, you see that 378, 368 number staying consistent no matter which state I pick because I'm getting that overall average that fixed function is doing the doing the work for me which is really nice and I don't have to go into an ETL and come come up with those averages and have to worry about how someone might be slicing the data next one's dealing with um, kind of creating uh, categories here or or ranges rather heat maps uh, one of my favorite cards to use. And so we've got this earthquake heat map uh, and creating what the magnitude is and creating different magnitude ranges in here. And you can look at this. And again, a great example of the case statement, be able to use that. So I'm doing where the magnitude is less than two, then let's call that zero to one. If it's less than four, then let's call it two to three, four to five, and then six plus. Very important in when you're working through kind of numerical values to go in a consistent order. And so that because case will grab the first thing that finds is true and not evaluate the rest. So don't kind of mix. If I put the less than two in the middle here, it would never uh, hit that because less than four would be be true first and then apply that. So get that, but then to order to um, order things right, then you need to create a second beast mode. And that's why I've got this mag range sort here. And that's, I'm doing the exact same case statement, but then at the end, rather than having string values, essentially what we were having with that zero to one and two to three, I'm putting numerical values to go into, to make that sorting work. So then when I sort descending, then we'll get the sort the way we want that to work. 
so that's really important when you're doing um, kind of larger numeric ranges, like financials, like 500,000, 1 million, that uh, the heat map will have trouble sorting that because those will be string values. So create a second sort or create a second beast mode. That's exactly the same, but just used for sorting purposes and then assign numerical values to that and then put that in there. So just make sure they stay in sync as you, if you have to change them down the road. Similar to that, uh, but more dynamically, uh, which has its pros and cons to it, is doing a dynamic range. We'll see this when we're working with bigger dollar values. We look at this. I didn't have to do a case statement in here. I said, hey, I want to break it up by $100,000 increments. So I'm going to take that number, divide it by 100,000, and then do a ceiling function, which basically just rounds it up to the nearest uh, number. And then I'm going to multiply it back out by, by 100,000. So then I get my 100,000 numbers. So you see 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, get that. But you'll notice um, because I don't have values in every $100,000 increment, then you're going to get a little bit of choppiness here. So kind of keep that in mind. If you're okay with that, then this, this will work. If you need kind of no gaps, then you might need to look into that first piece mode where you're doing more distinct uh, case statements to define those different ranges. But this is really helpful. Uh, for that, because then we can just take that same beast mode and put that in the sort and it'll sort because it's numeric values. And we can also format it as currency in this case and get that without having to create a string value and, and build out those that look for us. So pros and cons to each of those, um, depending on what your situation is and both uh, might want to use one versus the other. Next one down is a function I use a whole lot where you've got data in a string and you need to break it up uh, in here and say, say, hey, I maybe I want this uh, portion of a place um, split out from uh, the rest of this. I don't want the state in here. I just want that address in here. And, and maybe I want the state separate in this case. So we can do that using a really useful function that's actually not listed. When you look over here in the function list, you won't find a uh, split part here. You will find it in the ETL formula tile. Um, so you can use it there, but you can also use it here, even though it's not uh, listed. There are a number of functions that do work in both places and aren't, but just aren't listed here. Split part allows you to take a string and then define, hey, what do I want to, where do I want to split it on? Uh, what am I, what kind of character string am I looking for? In this case, I'm looking for that comma. And then do I want the first part or the second or the third, wherever, how many, many times you uh, run into a comma. So in this case, I want the thing before the comma. So I, I want number the first part. And that gets me this place address. If I wanted the part after that uh, comma, then I'm going to do a two. And that will get me the thing after the comma. If there are multiple commas in here. Maybe there's a couple commas. Then you could do a third and a fourth. But it just depends how many uh, commas you have in your data. Uh, but it works really well. And you can, I've got a other video on if you need to split things up um, dynamically because you don't know how many uh, times you might need to split it. Uh, I can, you can do that in ETL and I have a video uh, that walks you through how to do that. But in this case, in, in here, this is I'm letting, let, allowing me to do that. Uh, so that's pretty handy. If we wanted to split on the word of uh, by, tan by chance, we could do that. So let's just for fun real quick, change this beast mode and say we're looking for the word of. And we want that part after it. Chance. And that will get us in that South Pasadena uh, piece. So now we're getting kind of the city state, if you will. So a lot of different uses for it. Um, 
really helpful function that I use uh, quite a bit in ETLs and uh, in cards. Finally, this one here, which might be, might consider this number seven, eight, nine, and 10, although I just wanted to keep my title as seven. Uh, allows you to do some year-to-date totals uh, dynamically by um, taking, you know, you've got things are across different years and you want to show it across one year um, and be able to say, hey, how, how are things trending looking year over year uh, and but up to this current date. So a couple of things I'm doing here. First, I'm creating a standard date and I have a more detailed walkthrough about this in another video. If you want to look at that, I think it's called a, a year over year uh, comparison. But I'm taking the date in the date field uh, in the data set, and then I'm going to kind of move it into the current year automatically so that I can have use that as my calendar across the bottom and all, things always being, uh, you know, showing me that month, that year is kind of irrelevant. So I'm taking that date and then I'm looking at the current date and subtracting the year from it from the year of the date in the data set. And so then that gets me, if it's 2020, then it's going to give me a difference of four and push it forward four years. So then I will always have this, all my dates will be uh, in this current calendar year, if you will. Then in my series here, I've got uh, this, I'm just extracting the year out of the date reported and putting that in here. Uh, you can see I'm, and then in this car, this filter here, I'm the date range filter, I'm just setting this to this year by month to graph by month. And you see it's grabbing this, that standard date. And then if I want that year to date uh, to not go, because if I didn't have this in here, we're going to go out to December, and that's not what we want because this current year doesn't go that far. So I want that year to date in here. So we can do that one of two ways. So we could look at um, up to the previous day, if we were okay with including partial September and how it's developing, then we can use the day of year function. And so it's going to count up the number of days in the year of the date in the data set and compare that to the day of the year of the current date. And if it's less than that, then we'll include it. Otherwise we won't. And so that's why we just do this, drag it into the filters and select yes. So then it will um, bring everything up to September. Then if we wanted to say, no, we want to actually, you know, stop if it's not included, if it's an incomplete month. So do something like this, where we can just look at the month of the date in the data set. And is that less than the, the current month? So the month of the current date, if so, then we'll include it. Otherwise we won't. So when we switch to using this function, then you see now we drop and we're only including up to August now. So because September is not, uh, done so because we're still we're in September right now rather so so there was a quite a few beast modes right there um, again use uh, all of these um, quite often hopefully you found these helpful for you to be able to use and uh, create more effective dashboards and cards if you have any questions always uh, feel free to reach out thanks a lot